Hi, Jeremy Cordo in the Court of Public Opinion. I'm just on air here to let you know that we'll be live streaming the Court of Public Opinion every Friday between 9 o'clock and 12 on jeremycordo.com. Please join us. We'd love to have you. A mental illness doesn't have to be a life sentence. Alcohol addiction, abuse, misuse is the same all over the globe. Sparking the combos about Adelaide. So it made me feel very confident that if we did have it in the state, we were going to know about it. You should be having... There'll be guys that are trained, but they don't feel like they're good enough to take their shirt off. Almost everyone is a culprit of doom scrolling. Anyone who has a mobile phone. On Fresh 92.7. Welcome to Wavelength. Sparking the combos about Adelaide. You should be having... I'm Hamish and tonight. I am joined by David and Jamie. Welcome to the show, guys. Hello. Thanks for having me. Happy Monday. Happy Monday to you both. Um, I wish I was happier, though. I'm not happy at all. Yeah, yeah. Something (laughs) happened just before you came in the studio, didn't it, David? I was trying to enjoy a delicious um, beverage Mm. at the... Of the alcoholic kind. Of the the alcoholic kind, potentially. Lovely. At a pub around the corner and um, was minding my own business, sitting there doing some last-minute wavelength. And then a bird shout on me. Mm. <laughs> bird shout on me. Lovely. Yep. Lovely. And uh, as we all know, that's meant to be good luck. So, David, in, in, in the time that you have been shat on since coming into the studio, <laughs> what wonderful luck has befallen you? Has anything good happened so far? I wish I could say that. Instead, I was shat on a second time, Oof. also by a bird. Was it by the same bird? I reckon it was. <laughs> he like, came back for round two. They're just you out. They're like, I don't like the look of this guy. I Twice. What? Twice. What I love is that someone obviously, like, when this whole came about, like, someone was obviously trying to tell someone else, they were trying to make them feel better <laughs> yeah. about just being, like, shot on by a yeah. bird. So they're like, it's good luck. It's not, it's not good luck. It's if not. anything, it's bad luck. Yeah, you can tell that, that the first person this happened to totally. was just really in uh, damage control. Hey? Yeah, just no, 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 it's just... good luck, man. It's good luck. <laughs> like, you see the shit on my shoulder, man, I'm going to be I'm going to be the one having is the it... last laugh. I'll tell you what. Because <laughs> it comes from a Russian superstition, actually, yeah. where it's like, Apparently, it's like the rare odds of actually being pooped on by a bird is so low where they thought that it was more rare to be pooped on by a bird than it was to win the lottery. Oh. But but if anything, that's just that, <laughs> that just means it really is bad luck because you could have won the lottery, but I instead know. you were shot on. Well, think of how many times you've been shot on by a bird and how many times you should have won the lottery from there. Yeah. So I, should have, I think I should have won the lottery at least five times already. Oh, same. I mean, just judging by this twice, does that mean I should go out and buy a lottery ticket? Does yeah. Like have my- I'm, I'm just worried about how frequent you are being... Frequently, you are being shat on, Jamie. Um, <laughs> once I got, once I got uh, pooped on my bed That's four concerning. times in a day by four the times. same bird. Jeepers, my! You, you wronged the wrong we, bird. Me and birds just don't like. We just. It's not that we don't get on, but I just don't 100 percent trust them. <laughs> they're know, evil. They just are because you don't know what they're thinking, and they come from dinosaurs. And I think there's definitely some conspiracies going on there. Yeah, yeah, you know I mean? yeah. There's some long-running resentment there for sure. <laughs> I think I've just been swooped so many times. <laughs> Can't trust them. Oh well, enough about bird shit. Tonight on Wavelength, <laughs> <laughs> should the government be stepping in to build more social housing for survivors of domestic and family violence? A new report makes a compelling case that we sure nobody has to choose between homelessness and returning to an abuser. We're also chatting to a recent COVID conviction that has Hamish fired up. You better believe it. But next, we're talking to the South Australian Young Entrepreneur of the Year. You're listening to Wavelength. Wavelength. Welcome back to Wavelength, spiking the convos about Adelaide you should be having. We hope you're having a brilliant Monday so far. So, David, you Mm. spoke with a pretty impressive South Aussie this week. Can you tell us a bit about it? Mm, That's right, yeah. I jumped on the phone with uh, Luke Timmons, the co-founder of Adelaide Hills Lawn and Gardens, who was recently named the South Australian Young Entrepreneur of the Year. He's an absolute great guy. Let's, Let's have a listen to that chat. Wavelength. Luke, pleasure to have you on the show, mate. How are you doing today? Very well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. No worries at all. So, Luke, you've been named the South Australian Young Entrepreneur of the Year. What a massive achievement. How does it feel to be recognised like that, especially at just the age of 28? Yeah, it's pretty cool recognition. Um, I think we've discussed it. We were talking about how we sort of recognise it. It's more validation that we're on the right track with what we're doing. Um, Jared and I, we're not particularly about individual awards or anything like that, but how it relates back to the business, it just shows that what we're doing is generally on the right track and where we can keep working towards a good goal from there. Fantastic. And it's a great business. Can you tell me a bit about it and uh, I suppose how you got started with it? Absolutely, yeah. So Jared, actually, my business partner, we're in a partnership. He founded the business Adelaide Hills Lawns and Gardens. 
um, back in, oh, when was that, about 2013. Uh, I was at uni at the time. I actually um, dropped out to, to keep working with him. I was just working through him, with him through the holidays, dropped out to, to keep mowing lawns because I just found it interesting and liked it and working outdoors and earning a bit of money, it was great. Mm. So we sort of realised that, well, how about we combine our skills and form a partnership and go from there. So that's that was when the business sort of grew really quickly from there. Absolutely. And I understand that you went through a program uh, called Say Yes. Could you tell me and our listeners a bit more what that involved? Absolutely, yeah. So Say Yes or this is an acronym for the South Australian Young Entrepreneur Scheme. It's run by Business FA um, in partnership with the state government with some funding there. Basically, it's a, the way I describe it, it's a mini MBA. So it's only a 12-month course. Um, it's only a, a, a once-a-month commitment to a, an evening session. There's a little bit of work in between, but nothing major. Mm. And it just covers a really broad range of topics um, from marketing, HR, finance, business planning, legal, all these different topics. Um, it gives you a real top-line view of, of all the broad things that are generally involved in business, your business. Fantastic. Uh, I mean, it's clearly taught you a lot, but I mean, starting a business still, even with a program like Say Yes, isn't easy. What are some of your tips to young people listening to this story in Adelaide who might be interested in starting their own business? And- it is a pretty daunting task, no doubt. Um, I was fairly lucky in the fact that I've got a business partner in Jared that we can bounce a lot of ideas off of. I think seeking out mentors, particularly early on in your business journey, who have walked that life, they've been through it, they've seen the ups and downs, and they can sort of predict, you know, where you're going to flow in your business journey as well. And leaning on them as much as possible is is a really big one. Um, not necessarily one or two people, um, but you know, three, four, five, six, as many as you want, and from a diverse range of backgrounds as well. One might be you know, a parent or a, a former boss or something like that, or someone a peer that has gone on to a, a business life or something like that. Um, we've sort of picked a lot of people throughout our journey, um, and probably found the mentoring that you get from that holding good stead moving forward wavelength that right there was david having a chat with luke timmons uh, the south australian young entrepreneur of the year and what a great chat uh thanks for bringing that into the studio today david well what i found really interesting from his chat there was um luke makes a comment about how you know new business owners, uh, often when they're starting out, it's it's a really lonely journey, which I can imagine. But I think if his chat proves anything, it's that the ones that make it don't do it on their own. They do yeah. rely so much on the support from those around them and from resources like books and leaning on mentors and support groups like Say Yes, which is such a great initiative. And um, it's awesome to hear that we actually do have something like that in place for you know people who are just getting started in the world of business. Because I I can only imagine it must be an incredibly intimidating realm to enter into. So to know that there is a place, uh, uh, you know, a network that people can go to, to kind of get some guidance and get some help, it kind of makes me think that we are actually doing a, a little bit to make sure that people have the best chance to succeed in that world. So, and, and if people want to go uh, to source out that initiative, David, where, the, where do they go? Yeah, I mean, starting a business, hugely intimidating. And this program that's run by Business SA, Say Yes, uh, the acronym is S-A-Y-E-S. Ha, ha, ha. Very um, It's a 12-month <laughs> program for those aged 18 to 35 years old. And if you're keen on, I guess, learning out, learning about how to turn a business concept into a reality, just Google Business SA, S-A-Y-E-S, and you should be able to find it there. Fantastic. Anyway, coming up after the break, we've got a great interview for you all about the rise of homelessness tied to domestic and family violence. Not one to miss. So stick around. You're listening to Wavelength. Wavelength. Welcome back to Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having. To find out more, Jared spoke with Kate Colvin from the Council to Homeless Persons. Wavelength. Are you able to tell me more about the Nowhere to Go report that was commissioned by the Everybody's Home campaign, which was also recently delivered to the National Women's Summit? Could you be able to yes, elaborate sure. more on that? Yes, sure. So the Everybody's Home campaign commissioned this report to better understand what would be the impact on women fleeing family violence of having access to housing. Because what we know is that the biggest driver of homelessness for women and children is domestic and family violence. And what often happens when women 
flee their home is that they can't find another home because of affordability issues. And so um, when women and children come to homelessness services, only 3.2% of them are getting the long-term housing that they need. So this report identified that if we provided more long-term housing, social housing, then um, we could prevent um, almost 7,700 women a year returning to violent partners, which they do because they just don't have anywhere else to go, and 9,000 women a year becoming homeless, which is would be a really fantastic outcome because, of course, you know, it's a huge safety risk if women end up returning to a violent home because they don't have alternative housing, then they're at risk in that situation. But women are also at risk, aside from the fact that it's a really devastating experience, but it can also be quite dangerous for women um, to be homeless. So the housing plays such an important role in improving women's safety, and that's why we commissioned it in the lead into the Women's Safety Summit to show how important housing is in that whole picture about domestic and family violence. Why do you think that there is a low percentage of social housing available for victims and survivors of domestic and family violence? Do you see that as a lower priority from the federal government? Look, over the past couple of decades, the federal government's investment in social housing keeps reducing. And with the exception of the last few years, when some state governments have increased their social housing investment, um, the state's investment has also been decreasing. So we've had social housing reduced from more than 5% of all stock in Australia to currently 4.2% stock percent of stock nationally. So that, in practice, that just means it's much harder for anyone who's falling out of the rental market to get into social housing. And that applies also to women and children who are fleeing violence. So that's why we say we need the federal government to really step up their investment in social housing to really deliver those homes because they're so important. And we think that the states should also contribute that it's, it's a process that needs to be led by the Commonwealth Government so that we can have that housing delivered all around the country, but also because the Commonwealth Government's the one that really has the fiscal firepower to inject a lot of money into social housing construction. In what way can the federal government, along with the state and territory governments, go about wanting to inject or invest more funding to build more stock or social housing stock to reduce the number of victims and survivors of domestic and family violence having to rely on homelessness services? So right at the moment we've got an economic crisis because of COVID and particularly in the states that have had prolonged lockdowns and so one of the things that building social housing would do is create more jobs in, in the economy that are desperately needed. So I guess the simplest way that the federal government could do that investment is by partnering with the states and having a new partnership agreement that, you know, where they agreed that, you know, the Commonwealth government will put in X number of dollars and the states will complement that with, a, with you know, complementary funding. So to address this particular issue, we, the Equity Economics, the Nowhere to Go report showed that we need 17,000 additional social housing units each year. So that the cost of that would be $7.6 billion, but it would grow the economy by $15.3 billion and create 47,000 new jobs. So it's kind of a win-win, you know, it's building social housing delivers the homes that women and children fleeing violence really urgently need, but it also grows the economy and creates jobs. And my final question to you, Kate, will this go in the way of, do you feel that this is a good strategy to reduce or even help to end the cycle of chronic domestic and family violence that does occur a lot in many communities? Mm, that's a great question, Jared. I mean, I think one of the thing with housing is that it provides a way out for women and it can provide, you know, often women who are on a low income might be really struggling to afford housing on their own and end up perhaps in a relationship partly for 
economic reasons because, you know, they they can better afford housing and better afford, you know, everything in life if they, you know, partner up and, and have two incomes contributing to the cost of housing. So, and, and in that situation can, can sometimes, you know, be more at risk of experiencing domestic violence. But while the housing is really important part of the picture, it doesn't of itself stop the violence. So alongside an investment in housing, we also need to see governments investing in programs that, you know, help change the culture in our community that means that women are vulnerable to violence because it is most usually men feel like they have that entitlement to you know treat women with disrespect so those two things that are needed both the housing so that women can have a safe option to get out of a situation that's unsafe but also a change in attitudes and a you know a change in the level of violence in the community so they're not having that experience in the first place wavelength thanks so much for that jared anyway up next i'll be letting you know what the hell happened in the news this week wavelength Welcome back to Wavelength. Right now, I'm letting you know what the hell happened this week. What the hell is going on this week? Wavelength on Fresh 92.7. The big news this week was, of course, Sydney's triumphant end to lockdown after becoming the envy of the world. And no, not because of their high purity cocaine for once, but instead for reaching staggering vaccination numbers. And what did the city's population do with their newfound freedom? Well, instead of visiting long lost friends, checking in on their elderly family members, or even attending to their own personal hygiene at the nearest hairdresser, the people of Sydney responded the way anyone would by flooding Kmart stores at midnight and really I I get it. In saying that a number of hairdressers were in fact booked out after people came out of lockdown looking like Robin Williams in Jumanji. What year is it? Meanwhile in more Apocalypse Watch coverage new forecasts show which suburbs around Australia will experience temperature increases by 2050 and honestly that seems like a long time to wait for the people of Parafield to get hotter. An anti-vaxxer in Sydney tried to shame a cafe for promoting segregation on the scale of apartheid, despite 90% of the state's population being fully vaccinated, after he was asked to prove his vaccination before entering. The man posted a video online in which he demanded the internet make them famous, and that's just what they did. The cafe's social pages were soon flooded with messages of support, many pledging to visit the cafe for a coffee on their next trip into town. So much for all that division, right? William Shatner took to space this week in what could have only been a completely terrifying experience for his co-passengers, and it didn't take long for an unusual critic to surface when Prince William slammed recent efforts in the space race. I imagine there's just no point invading a new planet when there isn't anyone there to colonise or enslave. Probably just takes all the fun out of it, I guess. And finally, to Donald Trump. Remember that guy? Well, he issued a strange threat this week for Republicans to boycott any future elections, proving that he does not, in fact, understand how threats work. And that's what the hell happened this week. Wavelength. That was, that was a wild ride, as always. It's my favourite part of the show every Strap time. Strap yourselves hey, in, guys. What I want to talk about is William Shatner going to space. Now, yeah. mind you, actually, I reported this on the news earlier this week. He's 90. Yeah, what? really? Yeah, he's 90. He's popped off into space. He doesn't He's look a day chilling. over 70. Just living out his real life Star Trek fantasy. Yeah, exactly. Just really. <laughs> and really I mean, if you've ever seen him fans. in Star Trek, as I said, I, I feel like he would be quite an irritating person to be trapped in an enclosed space for uh, many, many hours. <laughs> <laughs> totally. was like, get me out, open the escape door. Um, I, congratulations, Sydney. Oh, 100%. Yeah, so yeah. happy for them. How good uh, is that? Incredible. Well done. I know, but I am yeah. a little bit jealous because. They got out of lockdown like a week ago on Monday, like yep. they just passed. And today they're allowed to go out and dance. Mm. We're the How? only state that can't dance. <laughs> what is going on? I, I, know, I, I, I know. I know we talked about this at length last week. I but know. I'm still... I know. It's still, it grinds my gears. It yeah. boils my milk too. It's just. I can't believe it's it. It's pretty frustrating. It's just insane but at also, this point. It's I'm starting it's to absurd. feel like we're an Amish community <laughs> yeah. or something. You know, like, Are we in the dome? We're just out there we're curdling the, dome. the milk. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. Like, get me out on? of this dome. I'm Damn so it. sick of it. I'm We've, sick of it too. We had a, not had any cases. They I had know. like a few hundred yesterday. Also, <laughs> yeah, right. Also the fact that they're like opening up their borders to Melbourne and they're also opening up international 
yeah, travel, yeah. which By is 1st great. Of November. Also love that the premiere was like, we're going to open it up to international travellers. And then <laughs> ScoMo was like, actually, no, no. <laughs> and he was like, nope. ah, I'm going to set my power here. Not yeah. yet. But that's pretty great. I mean, it's just one step to being able to travel again and, you know. It's like, a real rabbit in the hair situation though, isn't of, it though? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, like it. here we've just been plodding along <laughs> nice and slow, slow and steady, wins the race. And then just out of nowhere, boom, they've just, you know, overtaken us. Welcome to politics though. Yeah. I don't know. How, much, <laughs> how much is that new premier listening to their chief health officer anymore though? Like, yeah. I don't yeah. Think he's just, lot, he's just busted fair. down the doors yeah. like a rock star, hey, and he's just gone. He uh-uh. I'm the captain now. <laughs> Me. You're listening to Wavelength. 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 Welcome back to Wavelength. Spiking the convos about Adelaide you should be having. So, guys, earlier in the show, we heard from Kate Colvin from the Council to Homeless Persons about a new report into victims of domestic and family violence. Thanks so much to Jared for that chat. David, could you just condense some of the really key points from that chat for our listeners. Yeah, again, Jared, amazing conversation with Kate there. I think what really stood out to me is learning for myself that the biggest driver of homelessness in Australia in women and children actually stems from domestic violence, which I personally had no idea about. Um, It seems like there's like a real problem here, though, about not having the amount of housing here in Australia. There's Mm -hmm. like clearly a lack of investment or a lack of interest in building social housing at the moment. Mm -hmm. So we've got like 3.2% that aren't getting the long-term housing they need. Uh, It's preventing 7,700 women. Um, It makes them return to their violent partners, but also means that 9,000 people are becoming homeless. Uh, We also heard that the investment from federal government in social housing has just been going down lately, even in investment from the states. So social housing um, has reduced from 5% of all housing that's available in the country to just 4.2% of all housing in Australia. And um, it seems like it could be solved pretty easily too. We also heard that uh, they they need like about 17,000 additional social social housing units per year, which is going to be pretty expensive, 7.6 billion. But at the same time, that's going to be a big investment though, like a really big investment for our economy. And I think like This is a really important issue and, like, it's become a lot more – it's becoming more of an issue because of COVID, you know, like, with lockdowns and with people being trapped in their homes, like, Mm. more women and, like, because statistically it is women that are getting abused in domestic violence incidences – like the stati- the stats are going up. The stats have been going up. It's it's kind of like a public healthcare crisis now because yeah. it's been happening for well over a year, mm-hmm. where people don't like women don't know or they can't escape from their homes. They don't know where to go. Like if you think about the power dynamics of relationships like this, where they don't have any fun like financial gain as well. Like they've got nowhere to go. So it's really is it is up to our government to kind of like yeah help out these women that are and families and people that are escaping domestic violence in their homes, but. What I want to know is that is this more – is it treating a symptom versus the disease? Because mm. it's been it's putting all this emphasis on, you know, rescuing women and, uh, like, taking them out and, like, putting them in homes. But it's like we need to address the bigger picture here and the bigger picture is violence with men. Do you know what I mean? Like, totally. It seems like it's always trying to put, like, a solution-based kind of, like, a take on it versus, like – stopping it and nipping it in the bud at the core. For sure. And I totally I totally see where you're coming from from there. But I also think that generally this really highlighted to me that social housing across the board mm. is just non-existent. Yeah. And it's just going, the government's it's just getting not, worse. Yeah, the government's just like not putting in like enough funding in it. Yeah. And I definitely get what you're saying there, Jamie. I, I, I agree completely. But it's one of those things where that core issue of, you know, violence against women such a such a big cultural problem uh, that doesn't seem to have a, a really clear cut, defined, easy answer or solution as to how to fix that. Whereas I think with this, in regards to the social housing investment uh, solution, it's it's a bit more of a tangible solution that we can kind of point and to the government and look towards the government and go, if you do do this this result will happen. You will save X amount of women totally. from this and you will prevent X amount well, of people becoming homeless. Good, yeah, it's the perfect first like first step Definitely. in like making a bigger change. And it does start small at the end of the day. Like to change culture, it's going to start, we're going to have to do it in lots of different little industries and like work together for a bigger picture. Mm. Yeah, and then, uh, you know, it's tough as well because it's, it's an issue that's been around uh, for a while, both of them, you know, uh, the social housing issue especially. And then COVID comes along and really just compounds the whole thing totally. in a big, big way. And um, I think, 
you know, a, a really um, so many of the issues that we see in society kind of at the moment just seem to follow this really familiar pattern where, uh, you know, this problem would cost, you know, X amount of dollars to fix, but would ultimately provide, uh, you know, some sort of return over a long period of time. So it's that, that you know, like that short term loss for a long term game. But our politicians don't ever seem to want to bite that bullet, you no, know, because, you know, they're only in power for a uh, short period of time. So it's hard for them to disadv- to want to disadvantage themselves while they're in office to benefit people who they may never meet and um, and who they won't be in power when that reward is reaped, you know? Mm. So how do we how do we fix that? Such you know, how politics, do we fix hey? yeah, how do we <laughs> fix the self self selfishness uh, of of the political world, you know, like we need more selfless leaders who are willing to do something for the bigger picture, for 100%. the good of society. I mean, um, it's a big you know, question. Yeah. But I I mean, hey, I actually think it comes down to voting. I think it comes down to voting with us now. I think like younger generations as well I think if we put more emphasis on who we vote for and put more pressure on the government to do better for the things that we care about we can make more change than we think absolutely look uh if if anything that we've spoken about tonight um has affected you in any way please don't hesitate to call 1800 respect uh confidential information counseling and support service anyway we've still got plenty of wavelength left for you guys tonight so stay tuned you're listening to fresh wavelength Wavelength. Welcome back to Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having. And guys, uh, I think this this is a convo that we do need to have. Um, I, I read something in the local paper today, uh, which was written by David Pemberthy, mm. which um, has really struck a chord with me. Basically, uh, he, he talks about the two blokes that have just been locked up for going to the footy. These were the two guys that travelled, uh, of course, from Melbourne to Perth to watch the grand final. Um, and they've now actually been sentenced to 10 months Jeez. in prison, 10 months <laughs> of jail time. Okay. And, um, That's pretty rough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, what, what do you think about that, guys? Uh, do we think that's appropriate? Do we think that's fair? Well, what did they do? So they breached the Western Australian border That's rules. it. Yeah, exactly. They they dared to enter the utopia that is oh, Perth. Um, how do and you even get over there? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, they should have just, you know, I would have been like, I ain't, I ain't I'm even in, mad. I'm impressed. I'm that impressed, requires man. like a um, Mission Impossible level sort of planning. Exactly. I would have just given them the key to the city, to be yeah. honest. I'm surprised that people haven't done this before. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. it's surprising that this is the first time right. you're hearing of people do something like yeah. this. Yeah, well, it is like getting out of Alcatraz, getting into Perth. <laughs> so first time, first time you've heard someone get caught. Yeah. True. That's it, exactly. I <laughs> don't know. I think that I think that um, it's a really interesting law where it's like, like, yes, they've put a lot of people in jeopardy. How much... Like how much danger they put us all in, I who knows? Like the potential for danger, yes, totally. Could have been, but um, also, quite big. yeah, but I mean, like also, like the fact that they've been charged for the potential of something happening versus something actually happening, absolutely, would play a huge part in like in their sentence. So, like, is it fair? I don't know. And I think it's worth mentioning that you know there are some things that I think make this a little bit unique or should be worth noting. Uh, one of the guys uh, wasn't actually even from Melbourne, but Mount Hotham, which um, you know wasn't even in lockdown at the time, and and the other guy was fully vaccinated and had a COVID test in Darwin before entering Perth. So they, they at least did their due diligence to you know try and do this, I guess, as safely uh, as possible or or, like they they thought they didn't have COVID like they test themselves before they were still illegal though like Western Australia is close to everywhere I mean not South Australia but it's close to all of Victoria but it's just like you know if all of Australia is locked up why do these guys think that they have the right to go and do that? Do you know what I mean? Like, Absolutely. It's just, like that's just privilege. That's just privilege in itself. Of course. Game. Sorry. Ten, ten months jail It's though? pretty like well like they know how high the stakes are right now. Like <sighs> they, they do. Like they know the jeopardy of what's going on. So like I I don't know, there's part of me that's like, that's like, that's just you feeling that you have more entitlement. Yeah. Go, sure, sure. But I think, doesn't, don't you think it shows just how much Australia has changed in the last eight months? We're now sending people to jail for going to the footy. One of, <laughs> you know, backwards. Australia's greatest pastimes. I can't believe that's a sentence I'm, I'm saying. Now, don't <laughs> get me wrong. They did do the wrong thing. Absolutely. Uh, but, you know, the worst part of this for me is that 
there are plenty of people out there who commit truly horrible crimes who get less than this. Oh, totally. They get less time than this. There are people out there who are accessing, you know, vile images of, you know, child pornography, you know, abusing the elderly, um, you know, robbing our local establishments and businesses. And, you know, they get slaps on the wrists all the time for defences much much more paper thin than these yeah. guys. I mean, I think our political system and like the law system itself is like not very. It's not very consistent. Fair. And no, it's not consistent at all. It's not no. consistent in anything they do. Uh, one quote from the article that really stood out to me was was this. David said, "I can't help but feel that this case represents the formalized escalation of state power under COVID, where authorities have been more than happy to increase and then implement powers without parallel in our lifetimes." Now, mm-hmm. David is, you know, not some raving anti-vaxxer lunatic. He's a well-respected journalist in the community. And I can't help but agree with this in a very big way. I'm not a conspiracy theory a theorist or, or, you know, or anything like that. But people are treating this like it's the crime of the century. I don't know. And I'm, I, sort of, I'm sort of a bit on the fence. Look, we, we have laws in society all the time that are sort of preventing things like death. And I suppose this COVID law is in place to stop an outbreak. We have laws like you can't drink, drive, you can't speed because they're in there in place and you can get busted for it mm. because they're in place to prevent people from killing people on the road. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I see, I see a parallel here. COVID is extremely serious, mm. like, but Western Australia, South Australia, we're not, we don't have high levels of vaccination. If it, if it did get into the community, it could be disastrous. Yeah. I guess what I the, the the main point for me is at what point do we start thinking? Do we start kind of do law abiding people who have done all the right things and and kind of you know uh, borne some of the most ridiculous restrictions and kind of just cop them on the chin? At what point do people start to go enough is enough? You know, and I think we are seeing that in places yeah. like Victoria, you oh, know, totally. where people are just people are just fed up. People have just had enough. It's just gone. You know, at what point does it go time. too far? You know, we've we've just cancelled the city debate, yeah. a fully outdoor event, which could have been COVID managed so oh. easily in the same city where thirty thousand people were recently allowed to pack a footy I know. open. That How does that make any sense makes at me all? So angry that we can't even do an outdoor fun run, but we can still have the footy going on. Like it, it all makes comes no back sense. To I think we're getting pretty sick of it here. I think we're getting pretty sick. Oh, I'm so day. dead. I'm so over it. Absolutely. Look, we want to know what you think. Hit us up on the text line 0428 927 927. Tell us what you think because I think this is a pretty, uh, a pretty uh, heated topic um, and we want to hear your opinion. You're listening to Wavelength. Wavelength. Anyway, that brings us to the end of the show tonight. Thanks so much for listening. Make sure you're subscribed to the Wavelength Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and anywhere else that you get your podcasts. You can listen back to our old episodes right now and you'll be the first to know when tonight's episode goes up. Cracking show tonight, guys, but I've got some sad news. I won't be here next week, but I believe you two have an amazing show in the works. Absolutely. We'll be just fine without you, mate. <laughs> we actually we don't need you, but this is, we're voting off the All island. Right. This is actually uh, your exit interview. <laughs> um. Yeah, we're flying you live on air for our own enjoyable means. No. Oh, how wacky. No, I will how miss kooky. you. No, next week I've actually got an interview lined up with the new artistic director of OJ, Oz Asia Fest, Annette Chanois, and the exciting curation of the festival coming up at the end of this month. Oh, I'm pissed. I don't want to miss that. Yeah, that's right. You're missing out, man. Thanks oh. for joining me this week. You're listening to Fresh. Wavelength. Hi, Jeremy Cordo in the Court of Public Opinion. I'm just on air here to let you know that we'll be live streaming the Court of Public Opinion every Friday between 9 o'clock and 12 on jeremycordo.com. Please join us. We'd love to have you.